Well, hello everybody. Welcome to Blue Marble Science. Brian's Logic and Nathan Oakley and his entire crew have taken aim at geodesy and they are determined they're going to prove that this thing really is flat. Well, I got news for them. Geodesy is going to put up a fight. Warning. Severe facial and monitor damage alert is in effect. Get out the oven mitts. Push the monitors back out of punching range. And let's light this dumpster fire and have some fun. As we join the action, Nathan and his band of merry idiots are desperately trying to find Brian. Brian. Hey, Brian. Brian. Hello, Nathan. Hello, we've got you. Now, can you still hear me? I want to make sure this. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. I just wanted to make sure, that's all. <clears throat> sure. So, step one, explanation of the globe art assumption. Okay. This is the globe art, as we've been showing it. This is the blue, famous blue marble photograph. I have 16 more miles right across this. Officially, the globe art supposedly has 16 more miles east to west as opposed to north-south. <clears throat> Why? Supposedly, according to internet sources, the oblate spheroid vision of the globe art was first postulated by Isaac Newton. Hold on, Brian. You ask a good question, but then you didn't give an answer. You ask, why is the Earth an oblate spheroid? Then you started talking about who was the first guy to say it. It's not a game show. It doesn't really matter who said it first. The Earth is an oblate spheroid because it rotates. That causes its centrifugal force, and that causes it to bulge slightly at the equator. It's very, very slight. The graphic on the right is highly exaggerated. The graphic on the left is what you actually see. The bulge is so slight, it's imperceptible when you're looking at the entire Earth. Oh, by the way, you spelled Isaac wrong. Now, we don't personally know if this is true or false that he said this, but I will say that nobody of Isaac Newton's time could possibly have been able to say with certainty what the, glow, what the Earth is or is not. I am certain that if Isaac Newton could have taken a long haul plane journey, that if he postulated the Earth to be a globe or oblate spheroid beforehand, that he definitely would have had second thoughts afterwards. Right? What I mean by that, why I'm saying that is, the internet says a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, you know it does. Idiots like this guy on the internet saying stuff like the Earth is flat. And <laughs> true. Uh, Sir, yeah. for interrupting, but what's with this Isaac Newton? Isaac Newton. Oh, yeah. I might be having felt wrong, do I? <laughs> Two S's, you like... Uh, I meant to put in a Z, is it? Yeah, you misspelled it twice. Oh, well, it's <laughs> it's uh, you know it's what Let's not criticize the typos. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. The godfather of modern geodetic surveying is Al Biruni. Al Bruni is famous for supposedly calculating the 3,959 mile radius of the globe out. Okay, now we're off on Al Bruni. When are we going to talk about the ellipsoid and the geoid and how closely they match each other? When are we going to start talking about how we've measured that very, very accurately with our GPS satellites? What's going on? All we got so far is a history lesson. So uh, my point here is that, is that, uh, that uh, he couldn't have done this. But yes, he's the backbone of modern geodetic surveying. So I'm kind of showing from the very start where they're taking something as a pre-assumption and calling it fact. And now he's the godfather of modern geodetic surveying. Someone who may or may not, I don't know if the man even existed, or if he did, there's no way he could have calculated anything to any physical horizon because the horizon is not a physical place. So that's my point about this. That's why I add in that part. Brian, calling Al Biruni the godfather just to try to make him seem sinister in some way or the other, makes absolutely no sense. The guy was Islamic. He came from what is today, modern day, Uzbekistan. And anyone that thinks his method of estimating the radius of the earth has any bearing on modern day geodesy is a couple of sandwiches shy of a picnic. Oh, and don't leave that potato salad out in the sun. It'll make you sick. Okay, step two. So any any ex, any uh, questions about these? That's the first step. No, I'm and, keeping a fairly I, close eye on no. the chat. Oh, go on, Owen. Uh, no, nothing to add here. Okay. 
Except uh, the chat is going crazy. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure I'm saying something. It's Friday evening. Sure, but there's the nothing in response to what you're saying, Brian. Up. So let's move on. Okay. <laughs> Step two. Explanation of the role of the global ellipsoid and global geoid. Okay. On the left of the diagram is the representation of the global ellipsoid, and on the right of the diagram is the representation of the global geoid. The global ellipsoid is supposed to represent an idealized model of an average surface level covering the whole of the proposed oblate spheroid. So when the ellipsoid is referenced, what is being referenced is an average idealized surface level above mean sea level. That's based on, a, that's based on an oblate spheroid. When, where, where, sorry, whereas the global geoid is supposed to represent an idealized model of an average mean sea level, or above an underground surface level. So when the geoid is referenced, what is actually being referenced is an average idealized mean sea level above and under the ellipsoidal, ellipsoidal surface model. So up here, this is the WGS84 ellipsoid, basically. This is what it is, this is what we're referencing. And here with the wavy blue line over it is the geoid, which is supposed to be mean sea level. So these are, these are what? These are starting positions, let's just say, for geodetic surveying. This is a starting position that they will use. They will reference the ellipsoid and the geoid all the time. OK. OK, definitions of an ellipsoid and a geoid. I said this is important. Oh, no, you don't. We're not going to read dictionary definitions of this stuff. Sleeping warrior style. You guys can do that on your own time. Now, look, Brian. It's not surprising that geodetic surveyors would refer to the geoid and the ellipsoid frequently. After all, that's what they do. It's called geodesy. Or did that go over your head? For the sake of the presentation, I put it in. But, but hold on, this is kind of a false dichotomy, you know? The One. ball earth, the, the supposed testicle earth, and the disc earth. Yes. Yeah, no, he's the just UN explaining flag. what... It's just to explain so what, what the reference what's so far. The proof it, that the it's it's that it's the not he's not presented a dichotomy. A Owen, circle. Owen, Owen, he's not presented a dichotomy. He's just explaining what they do in geodesy so far. He's not he's not presenting an argument. He's just doing a presentation. <laughs> I know. I'm just uh, reading in between the lines. They have localized these datums to a point where they start to re represent the reality that we see and know. This is a very important point in the process of bringing the globe model and our flat reality together. Okay, so this is what this is what it is. When they start localizing everything, they can start saying, "Oh well, we don't really see as much curvature anymore." You know what I mean? They can start kind of uh, hand waving away the curvature that that they don't see, that they think, "Yo, know, that this is the curvature they don't see." They can start hand waving it away, but they still uh, only have diagrams at this point. It's not That's hand waving; it's downplaying it. Yeah, it's, uh, well, I mean, if they really put in, went looking for it, they wouldn't find it. So they have to hand wave it or downplay it, whichever. It's the same thing. You have to. The, the, downplaying, all they've got the, around. the downplaying is basically, uh, yeah, making it so small that, yeah, it, it uh, eludes the senses. That's basically their uh, final strategy. It's not a strategy, Arwen, it's reality. Now, at this point, Brian has gone on and on for the better part of an hour talking about ellipsoids and geoids and thoroughly confusing everybody that's listening to him. The only picture he'll throw up is a cartoon that looks like this. Now, this thing is highly exaggerated. The, the variation in the geoid in a cartoon like this has been magnified by a factor of 10,000 times or more. In reality, what you would see is this. The cartoon on the left is what the geoid actually looks like. The variation from the ellipsoid ranges from about 85 meters in Iceland to about minus 106 meters in India. It is minuscule compared to the size of the Earth. So I really think the way you guys go about representing this stuff is pretty disingenuous. I, I, I physical showing proof to show this supposed curve, they don't have it. And things that they supposedly do have, or what I'll show later on in the GPS section, is nonsense. When you see what they actually do and the trick they actually play upon themselves. But this is the start of it. When they are at that point where 
they're looking at trying to survey such a huge area, they can call it a globe if they want, because it's all in sections that they're surveying this, and they can't see the whole lot in one go. As I said, even with a P1000 uh, camera with an IR filter, you won't be able to see 100 square miles in a 300, 360 degree view. And even if you could, there's lens distortion and other things that could help you believe it's a globe if you want it. You know, so, I mean, th this is the point I'm talking about here. That's why I'm giving an explanation of that, of why I'm saying what I'm saying here. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll move on. No, I don't think we're going to move on, Brian. I think you got a problem here. Here's your black swan. There's platform habitat. There's platform hill house. I've drawn a circle around it. I wonder how much area is inside that circle. I know. Let's draw another circle. See if we can match the one that I've got there. Pretty close. There we go. Well, let's see. Radius, 5.67 miles. That's not very far, is it? Area. 100.59 square miles. Do you have any idea what you're talking about, Brian? It doesn't look like it. Just lost your audio, Brian. Brian. Can you hear us? Because we can't hear you. Friday night. Or it's how they pre assume it. The Z here, the Z axis, the zenith, is always through the North Pole. The X is out at the prime meridian, and the Y is out the opposite way, uh, out at the equator. Uh, it's a, what they call a right-handed, I uh, can't remember the name for it now, but it's a, it's a right-handed, you use your right hand to show it, basically. Right, let's, right. Get it, let's get it pegged. Adam, are you there? What's that symbol between that looks like a right angle between X and Y? Can you see that little symbol? I don't know that symbol, do you? Which one do you want me to do? This one? No. Or this one? That one, yeah. That's what you were referring to, was it not? Mega? Is that not what you were referring to? Can't hear Adam. Can anybody else hear Adam? I can't hear Adam at all, no. I, no, no sound of Adam. No, nothing from Adam. No, I might have to come back to it. So... All XYZ coordinates make a rectangular box, okay? And you, that means you have to use conjoining right angles. For those out there who don't understand, this is a right angle. This is an egg. This is a parts per million counter. And this is a jackass. Hey, Tony. Okay, that's a right angle. It can't, a right, which means it has to be on a flat plane. It always has to be on a flat plane. For them to join, it has to be on flat plane because they don't go over curves, right angles. They don't deal with curves, they deal with corners. This is a right angle. Again, this is the definition of a right, this is a right angle. This is the definition of a rectangle and a box. A plane figure with four uh, straight sides and four right angles, especially one with unequal adjacent sides in contrast to a square. Box, a container with a flat base and sides, typically square or rectangular and having a lid. Cartesian coordinates are all based around a three-dimensional rectangular box. That's what they are. No matter who uses them or what way they pre-assume, pre-assume whatever they want beforehand or afterwards, when you're doing anything with a Cartesian coordinate system, you you always use a, a, a rectangle, you always make everything into a flat, a motionless plane. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a 2D, if it's a 3D, it's a rectangular box. Okay, how to read Cartesian coordinates. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, just give people a, ro a rundown on it. Anyone can learn this. Uh, Cartesian coordinates can be used for locating points in three dimensions in this uh, example. <clears throat> okay, zero is here. Okay, so let's try and show you as much as possible. The zero in the, in the center is your starting point. It's called the origin, right? From here, you start with the X axis, which is this one, right? Uh, if you read the X to the right, it's positive. If you read it to the left, it's negative. So this is a positive reading of X. This is a negative reading of X. 
Then you read the y-axis. If you read the y forward, it's positive. And if you read the y backward, it's negative. So, sorry, you know, this is forward where the y is. So forward is uh, positive and backward is negative. I'm glad uh, you said that, Brian, because that means the numbers are wrong. It should be minus two, four, five. Uh, as opposed to saying negative. Yeah, shouldn't that, that x coordinate be a negative? Yeah, I'm, well, not, I'm just being a geek. I'm sorry, but no, no, you're right. No, no, it is plus to the right and uh, minus to the left. But I just use the words positive and negative. The, the other That's... z and y coordinates are positive, even though they're placed in a negative sorry, position. It, it, yeah, it's, it's the issue that where you've got two, sorry. four, and five in brackets, Brian hasn't put a minus next to him. Just on yeah. the two. Well, I didn't write that. That's someone else's. Dog. I know. I wasn't picking Brian up. Yeah, I knew that. I won't. Yeah. That's why I said it, Brian. It's just <laughs> two. Sorry. So it's, I just want to be. I just want to be clear, just for the, so the error is corrected. So, on the x-axis, going towards the left, it would be minus two. Is that the only yeah. correction? Yeah. Yeah. The coordinates should read minus two and four and five. If okay. you look at the, there's a positive increase in the z-axis, and the y-axis looks is going up, but it's the x that's going to the left, which is. No, no. Oh, it's good. I'm glad you've corrected it. You know, good. You left out a word. The top line should have read how to read Cartesian coordinates incorrectly. How did you fuck knuckles manage to screw this up? There's two units in the positive X direction. There's four units in the positive Y direction. And there's five units in the positive Z direction. Those coordinates are correct. Two, four, five. Not minus two, four, five. And you guys think you can tell geodetic surveyors how to do things. Man, this is really sad. Can you guys hear me now? <laughs> we hear you, Alvin. Uh, yeah, because I had a little uh, comment uh, on the previous uh, train of thought. Go ahead. Uh, I think I lost it. Oh, you didn't lose it, Arwen. You never had it to begin with. But hey, you guys hang in there. Trust me. You are special. Hey, thanks for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And remember, when we say, how stupid can you be, that isn't a challenge. It's just a question. Hey, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons down there. Click the little bell if you want notifications. They'll let you know when we got a video coming out. And a special thanks to our patrons. There's a link to the Patreon account. Anything you can do to help us is greatly appreciated. And we will catch you guys on the next one. Hey, Gladys. We're out of here.